finally, recess. Time for young space dinosaurs to take a break from the rigors of reptile academics and have some intergalactic fun. Now, we humans aren't just here to play hopscotch and freeze tag. In this sketch, we'll be looking at dihybrid crosses. I guess you could think of this as honors punnet squares. Yeah, so much for a break from the rigors of academics. In a dihybrid cross, the inheritance patterns of two genes are examined. These young dinosaurs are jumping rope double dutch with two vines to remind us that dihybrid crosses examine two genes. Punnett squares can be used to predict the genotypes and phenotypes of offspring produced in a dihybrid cross. However, there are a few considerations that make dihybrid crosses a little different than monohybrid crosses. First, to use a Punnett square for a dihybrid cross, the genes under consideration must be unlinked. That is, the allele inherited at one gene doesn't affect which allele is inherited at the other gene. Genes on different chromosomes are always unlinked. If the two genes under consideration are on the same chromosome, they must have a recombination frequency of at least 50%. Check out our recombination and linkage video if this doesn't sound familiar. Notice that these two allele flowers are located on separate vines? That's to remind us that the two genes examined in a dihybrid cross must be unlinked, like genes on separate chromosomes. Aww, the parents showed up to watch over their kiddos. And wow, they look way cooler than my parents. Sorry, Mom. These haploid haplosauruses represent parental gametes. Their shirts represent which allele they carry at gene A, and their hats represent which allele they carry at gene B. Notice the uppercase A on his shirt? Tropical shirts represent a gamete that carries a dominant allele for gene A. Those boring khaki polos on some of the other dinos represent a recessive allele for gene A. Similarly, this sick galactic bucket hat with an uppercase B represents a gamete with a dominant allele for gene B. The space helmets are recessive because, well, bucket hats will just always be dominant. Because genes A and B are unlinked, these parents are equally likely to have any hat-shirt combo. Also, there are only two types of hats and shirts, because we'll only be considering cases where there are only two alleles for a gene. You can see that these parents have four possible shirt-hat combinations. That's because in a dihybrid cross, each parent has four possible gamete genotypes. Now, some of these genotypes may be repeated if the parent is homozygous for either gene. These duplicates are still listed in the Punnett square, though, so there will always be four genotypes listed per parent. Remember that in a Punnett square, rows represent the genotypes of one parent's gametes, while columns represent the genotypes of the other parent's gametes. Since each parent has four possible combinations of alleles in their gametes, a 4x4 Punnett square is used. Now, from here on out, dihybrid crosses proceed much the same as monohybrids, with parental gametes combining inside the boxes to fill out the genotypes of zygotes. Offspring will inherit two alleles for each gene of interest one allele from each parent. Since there are two genes of interest, with two copies each, there will be four total alleles listed in each square. Like in a monohybrid cross, the goal is to estimate the relative number of each zygote genotype that will be produced in a cross. For example, in this cross, we'd expect an approximate ratio of four out of every 16 offspring to be heterozygous for both genes. And, a word to the wise, a dihybrid cross between individuals heterozygous for both genes is commonly encountered. That means crossing two big A little a, big B little b individuals. It's worthwhile to memorize the ratio of offspring phenotypes predicted for this cross. So, let's break it down. If there are 16 offspring generated, the same as what the square shows, 9 of 16 should be dominant for both traits. 3 would be dominant for trait A and recessive for trait B, 3 would be recessive for trait A and dominant for trait B, and one lone individual should be recessive for both trait A and B. But, remember this ratio is just an estimate of expected frequencies. Since real fertilization is subject to randomness, most crosses will not adhere to this ratio perfectly. This is sometimes simply referred to as the 9331 ratio. Check out these studious dinos practicing math at recess. 
Their 9 equals 3 times 3 times 1 equation represents the phenotypes produced in a heterozygous dihybrid cross. Well, the bell is going to ring any second, so let's review. A dihybrid cross is used to examine the genotypes and phenotypes of offspring when there are two genes of interest. Punnett squares can be used to predict the outcome of dihybrid crosses, but the two genes of interest must be unlinked. Because there are two genes being examined and each parent carries two alleles for each of those genes, there are four allele combinations in each parent's gametes. That means a 4x4 four four Punnett square is used. Once the genotypes of the parental gametes are determined, a dihybrid Punnett square fills in just like a 2x2 two two monohybrid Punnett square. In the case of a double heterozygote cross, the 9331 ratio tells us the predicted ratio of offspring phenotypes. Okay, okay. It might not have been playing hopscotch, but all that learning really wasn't so bad. Plus, we got free fashion advice from the hippest middle aged intergalactic dinosaurs. We really should be charging extra for that. So, you better take it and run. See ya.